um, our last presentation will focus on the uh, rheumatic heart disease and the take home take home points from the new um, ASC guidelines published earlier this year. I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Carlos Gallardo. He's the director of the Adult Cardiac Anesthesia National Institute of Cardiology in Rio de Janeiro, where he com completed his medical training and also anesthesia residency, followed by a cardiovascular anesthesia fellowship here in Toronto at Toronto General Hospital. He's a fellow of the American Society of ECHO, and from 2015 to 2020, he has served as on the on the International Committee of the Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesiologists. Gallardo, thank you very much for being here, and I'm going to hand over to you now. Hi, my name is Carlos Gallardo, I'm a cardiac anesthesiologist, currently working at the National Institute of Cardiology in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. But I'm relocated to Canada very soon to work at Hamilton Health Science and McMaster University. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Vegas and Dr. Papa, for the kind invitation for me to participate at the 2023 Toronto Perioperative Echo Symposium. My topic is rheumatic mitral valve disease. What are, are the take home points from the new ASC guidelines? I have no disclosures. So the objectives are to review anatomic and hemodynamic considerations in the assessment of rheumatic mitral valve disease, discuss technical aspects in echocardiography imaging for rheumatic heart disease, and also apply some recommendations based on the latest ASC guideline in the intraoperative decision-making process that was also published in 2020. So this is the, the guideline that I'm going to talk about. It was published uh, at the beginning of this year, this document provides recommendations for the comprehensive use of echocardiography in the diagnosis, classification, risk assessments, and therapeutic intervention of rheumatic heart disease. So rheumatic heart disease is a major global health concern. Data from the World Heart Federation uh, estimate that almost 300,000 patients uh, dies as a complication of rheumatic heart disease every year. So there is a high incidence of people living with rheumatic heart disease, and 90% of cases occur in low and middle income countries. So it's also a disease from the young age. Rheumatic heart disease is the most commonly acquired heart disease in people a, a age 25 and younger. In terms of pathophysiology, rheumatic heart disease is the long-term consequence of an immune-mediated injury to the heart and cardiac valve following acute rheumatic fever, usually after infection by the group A beta hemolytic streptococcus and manifesting as clinical manifestation as tonsillopharyngitis two to four weeks after the, the infection, which starts presenting some symptoms. Uh, carditis is the most common presentation in the acute phase. And we know that damage to the cardiac valve is a chronic sequela of carditis. So in a more chronic uh, commitment of the disease, with chronic inflammation response to cardiac tissue, which start developing uh, valvular stenosis and regurgitation. And most of the patients usually develop, develop right, right 
heart dilatation, pulmonary hypertension, supraventricular arrhythmias, and heart failure. So rheumatic, the most common presentation of acute rheumatic valvulitis is mitral and aortic valve regurgitations. So mitral stenosis is the common, it's most, more, more, most, the most common chronic lesion of rheumatic heart disease. So in the few acute phase, there is some aortic and mitral regurgitation in more chronic phase, uh, mitral stenosis is the predominant lesion. So rheumatic heart disease is the most common global etiology of mitral stenosis. And if we see we are facing a patient with suspicions or documentation of mitral stenosis, the first, the first diagnosis in mind should be rheumatic heart disease. So in the OR, it's important to use a multi-parameter echo approach using 2D, 3D, color flow, and spectral Doppler. For the assessment of mitral valve, the goal of the exam is to confirm known findings and exclude additional pathology that may alter the surgical plan. So it's important to evaluate interval chains in terms of quantification from the time of the diagnosis made in the patient's indicate for surgery or, or interventional procedure at the time of the in, in the OR, because sometimes there is some modification or commitment in the other valves. So it's important also to guide surgical interventions and hemodynamic management, and also to assess the results of the surgical procedure at the end. So let's focus to talk about rheumatic mitral stenosis assessment. So rheumatic mitral stenosis should be evaluated in a comprehensive approach, including careful examination of mitral valve morphology, both in 2D and 3D imaging. So to accurately determ determine the mitral valve area by planimetry, and also to assess the severity of calcification, thickness, mobility of the leaflet, as well as annulus size. It's also important to quantify the mitral stenosis through Doppler findings. So we usually use color flow Doppler to assess tubulate diastolic flow and also PISA, radios and area. So using pulse wave and continuous wave Doppler to measure peak velocity and mean pressure gradient, pressure half time and acceleration time to estimate mitral valve area. And also, it's very important to ex estimate systolic pulmonary arterial pressure. So in rheumatic mitral stenosis, there are potential different associated findings that we need to look for, not only clinically, but also through the echo. So with uh, inflow obstruction from the, uh, for the mitral valve, so there is an increase in, in right atrial pressure with left with increasing left atrial pressure with left atrial dilatation supraventricular arrhythmia aphibis commonest arrhythmia in this group of patients we can also should we should also access uh, look for spontaneous echo contrast in left atrial thrombus usually in le at the left atrial appendix and the left atrial wall so with chronic condition, it's it's usually to see an increase in PA pressure as well as an increase in pulmonary capillary pressure. And as a consequence, right ventricular volume and pressure overload, right ventricular dilatation and right ventricular dysfunction. It's also common to find functional TR as a consequence of tricuspid annulus dilatation. And also, we should look for right rate dilatation, right rate to pressure overload, and also some alteration in the hepatic vein flow. So, rheumatic mitral stenosis has some characteristic morphological features, including leaflet thickening with or without calcification. Usually, the, the, the thickening starts at the leaflet tips. Uh, commissure fusion is very common findings for mitral stenosis. Uh, usually, uh, both commissures 
can be fused. So thickening and shortening of the subvalvular apparatus, as we can see in the figures on the right, is all another uh, findings in rheumatic mitral stenosis. So we also should look for the, the mobility of the lipids so we, we can find the restricted lipid motion resulting in doming or hockey stick appearances of the anterior mitral valve leaflet during diastole. It's also pathognomonic to see doming and hot stick lesion appearance. So just to illustrate the figure from the, from the guidelines, uh, it was done, it was obtained through Transtoraski Echo. Uh, figure A, it demonstrates by commissure fusion, as we can see. Figure B, cordial thickening and calcification. It's in pressure to, to evaluate the subvalvular apparatus, as we can see here in the parasternal long axis view. Uh, fusion of the cordes and also calcification and also it, we can notice uh, left atrial dilatation. Figure C, we can see very well the diastolic doming appearance of the anterior leaflets with a hock stick appearance. Rest also restriction motion of the, the posterior leaflets Figure D, we see very well the, the calcification on the tip of both lift, the anterior and posterior, and also a, a doming of the anterior leaflets. Just to illustrate the, the image obtained by TEE in a patient that was scheduled to undergo mitral valve replacement due to mitral stenosis. So we can see a diast uh, mid in, on the left, a mid-esophageal four-chamber view that we I can see that there are thickness of the both leaflets with diastolic doming of the anterior leaflet and the restriction motion of the posterior leaflets. Yeah, also the lack of, of coaptation at the center of the valve. On the right, uh, mid-esophageal long axis view, we can see a hot stick appearance of the anterior leaflets, a doming of the anterior and posterior leaflets, and also we can see some calcification at the subvalvular apparatus. So another image from 2D TEE that we can see on the left, four chamber view with color flow Doppler. You know, uh, assessing the, we can see the, the mitral valve inflow acceleration and also mitral regurgitation. Uh, we notice also a PISA formation during the diastole. On the right, we can see that there is a, a central regurgitant jet through the mitral valve. So, um, the guideline also states the classification of severity of mitral stenosis. They recommend to use a multi-parametric approach, approach using calculate the mitral valve area, the pressure half time, the mean gradient, and systolic pulmonary artery pressure. So when, when patient presents uh, a, a mitral valve area below 1.5 centimeter square uh, pressure half time below uh, greater than 150 milliseconds a mean gradients greater than 10 millimeters of mercury and systolic pulmonary artery pressure greater than 50 millimeter of mercury we can classify this patient as having severe mitral stenosis on the other hand patients with more than 2.5 centimeter square of air mitral valve area pressure half time below 100 milliseconds mean grade below five millimeter of mercury and systolic pulmonary arterial pressure below 30 millimeter of mercury the patient is great as having mild mild stenosis and in between of these uh, numbers 
the patient is graded as having moderate mitral stenosis. It's important to mention that the, the mean gradient should be measured with a heart rate between 60 and 80 beats per minute. Planimetry is the preferred method, method for determining the anatomic mitral valve area uh, at, during, trans, during transesophageal work where in the OR, we should look, look at the mitral valve area through the transgastric basal short axis view, uh, especially in the uh, tracing the, the mitral valve area in the zoom mode at mid diastole. In thrustoracic uh, echo, we should use the parasternal short axis view to obtain the planimetry of the valve. It's in, there are some key points when we are measuring doing planimetry. Uh, it's affected by tomographic plane, uh, gain and calcification in, in patients with heavily uh, leaflet calcification or an excessive gain. Uh, the patient usually underestimates mitral valve area. On the other hand, when we measure the the when we we don't we don't measure at the narrow uh, orifice area of the valve that is stated here demonstrated here at the yellow dot the line when we measure above in the at the funnel shape of the mitral inflow if we will we measure above of this we for sure are going to overestimate the mitral valve area so because of some difficulties that we have by 2D, the 3D is now recommended by the, 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 the guidelines uh, using a multiplanar image to guide the planimetry at the mitral valve leaflet tips uh, that we can usually uh, adjusting the tomographic plane uh, on the left to measure the mitral valve area at the narrowest point of the the mitral valve. We can also do planimetry through 3D zoom, assessing both the left atrial side or, or, or even the left ventricular side, also doing planimetry in both of them, as we can see here, demonstrating this figure, and to estimate uh, both the, the mitral valve area in all of these assessments. So here we can see some demonstration that the importance of 3D assessments of the mitral valve. We are able to see very well the bicomissure fusion of the mitral valve, the, the reduced size of the mitral valve area. We also see on the left side an, an area of calcification in the close to the posterior median commissure at the mitral annulus. We also are able to see there is there are some restriction of posterior mitral valve leaflets, seen also through the ventricular side. So in terms of hemodynamic considerations, there are many parameters that we should obtain the, the mitral valve mean pressure gradient is an easy one. So that during TE, we should look at the mediasophageal four chamber view and mediasophageal long axis view to align our colorful color continuous wave Doppler to get the high velocity through the narrow of the mitral valve. So the Doppler beam is guided by the highest flow velocity zone identified by the color flow Doppler. So it's important to state that it depends on the heart rate and the flow conditions. So every time that we are measuring the mean pressure gradient, we should report uh, the, the heart rate and blood pressure at that moment. So in case of patient presenting atrial fibrillation, we should average five cycles at least and do the, the 
to average the, the mean pressure gradient. So another uh, parameter to measure is the pressure half time, the PAT. The PAT represents the time required for the pressure gradient to decrease by half from its peak value at the early mitral inflow. As you can see on the, fi on the figure, figure on the right side, we see that there is there are different of pressure between the left atrial and the left ventricle so when the time that it decay from the peak to 50 percent is the 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 is how to measure the pat so the formula that they use is it's a very simple formula that we divide 220 by the pat so if the PAT is close to 220 or greater than 220, 220, 20, so the mitral valve value should be at least one centimeter square. So there are some key points to consider stated by the, the guideline. So we should state that the left vent compliance is normal and there are no other source of left ventricular filling, such as shunts, or aortic regurgitations. If we have aortic regurgitation or an increased left ventricle compliance, the, the time to obtain the equilibrium between the left atrial pressure and the left ventricular pressure is fast enough, and we are going to have a low PAT overestimating the mitral valve area. So uh, PAT is not useful immediately after mitral balloon valve loplasty because of the load conditions that is going to happen after the balloon valve loplasty. So key points to measure PHC. So it's important to optimize continuous wave mitral inflow velocity to coaxial align the best uh, best as possible to obtain the to trace the the slope of e wave so the machine software will display for us the pat and mitral valve area and the same as mean pressure gradients uh, the pressure half time in patient with atrial fibrillation we should also average over five cardiac cycles There are some patients that present a biphasic deceleration slope of the mitral inflow, as we can see in the figure, figure obtained from the, the guidelines. So that we see there is an acute uh, early step deceleration that is represented by the red dotted line and a more gradual uh, deceleration at the mid diastole. Uh, if we are in face of this uh, uh, case, the deceleration slope should be traced in the mid diastole rather than early steep deceleration slope. So we should measure at the the white dotted line. So continuity equation is another possibility to measure to estimate the mitral valve area. It's also based on the law of the conservation of the mass. So flow volume at the mitral valve should be equal the flow volume at another valve. Usually we use the cross-section area or LVOT and the VTI or LVOT to estimate the mitral valve area. If you use this formula, so you also divide by the VTI of the mitral valve to obtain the mitral valve area. So it's important to notice that the, it's important to have no valvular regurgitation on shunts to estimate the continuity equation. And this formula, there are multiple measurements, so there are many sources of errors so that we should have in mind. So proximal isovelocity surface area, PISA, it's another way that we should look, the same way that we should measure during the assessment of mitral regurgitation we can use for mitral stenosis it's also based on the properties of flow dynamic 
It applies the continuity principle to color flow Doppler mapping in the area of mitral valve orifice. So as stated and illustrated here, so the principle is that the flow volume at point A, also the maximum acceleration of flow, is the same as flow volume at the narrowest point of mitral stenosis. So if we calculate the area of the conduits and the flow in the flow velocity, we are able to obtain the mitral valve area. So we use this formula to estimate the mitral valve area. So in this case, we need to obtain the radius of the PISA. If the, the hemisphere is not 180 uh, presentation, we should angle for correction factor to, to, to increase our accuracy of measurements. So we also have to measure the, the peak velocity to obtain the mitral valve area in, in this formula. So percutaneous balloon mitral valvuloplasty is also stated in the guidelines. It is the treat, treatment of choice from symptomatic rheumatic mitral stenosis. There are several scoring systems proposed to assess the suitability of, of balloon mitral valvuloplasty. The one of the most used that are the is the Wilkins score for mitral valve anatomy assessments. They usually take into consideration uh, the mobility of the leaflets, the thickening of the leaflets, the calcification grade, and also the subvalvular thickening of the mitral valve apparatus. So the total score is the sum of the four items in the range between 4 and 16. If a patient presents with a score below 9, it's suitable for uh, percutaneous balloon mitral valvuloplasty. So the successful uh, procedure is done when the mitral valve area at the end of the procedure is greater than 1.5 centimeters square with no more than mild mitral uh, regurgitation. So let's focus now, focus now on the assessment assessment of rheumatic mitral regurgitation. So the guideline also states that the mitral regurgitation is the most common valvular abnormalities at the early rheumatic heart disease stage. The rheumatic mitral regurgitation is caused by incomplete leaflet coaptation due to thickening and scarring of the leaflets as well as caudal shortening that restrict the motion of the leaflet in systole and diastole. If you remember, the rheumatic mitral disease is classified as type 3A in the Carpentier's functional classification of mitral regurgitation. So rheumatic mitral regurgitation assessment should be done in the same way that was previews re recommended by the ASC guideline on native valve regurgitation published at, in 2017 with an update in 2020. The integration of multiple parameters should be done is required and it's more accurate re uh, evaluation for rheumatic, rheumatic, rheumatic regurgitation severity. There are multiple parameters that we should look for. The most difficult uh, to grade the severity is when we have a patient with in between moderate to severe mitral regurgitation, but uh, there are many important uh, parameters to classify patients as having severe mitral regurgitation, such as the vena contracta width greater, greater than 0 0.7 centimeter, the PISA radial greater than one, at, at a Nyquist limit between 30 and 40 centimeters per second, uh, central jet area, uh, central jet, central large jet area greater than 50% of the left atrial area, so, systolic flow reversal at the pulmonic pulmonary vein, 
So the effective regurgitant orifice area greater than 0.4 centimeter square, regurgitant volume greater than 60 ml, regurgitant fraction greater than 50%, uh, we all of these parameters grade the mitral regurgitation as grade four or severe mitral regurgitation. The guideline also recommends uh, that quantification of mitral regurgitation severity by vena contract and PISA methods uh, should be included when ne whenever feasible. So we also, every time that we access a mitral regurgitation, we should, should uh, assess the three phases of the jets, the proximal flow convergence zone, the vena contracta, and the regurgitant jet area. Based on this parameter, we, we are able to calculate the regurgitant flow, the effective orifice, regurgitant orifice area, and the regurgitant volume. So 3G became very important in the assessment of also uh, to degrade rheumatic mitral regurgitation. It provides an accurate and reliable measurement and combined with color Doppler has the ability also to determine the origin the extent and the trajectory of regurgitant jet. We also have to measure the vena contracta and estimate the radius and the PISA area by doing the multiplanar reconstruction with color flow. So in summary, rheumatic heart disease is a major global health concern. Echocardiography plays a major role in the assessment of rheumatic heart disease. Rheumatic mite stenosis and mite regurgitation should be evaluated with a comprehensive approach using different echo parameters. The typical anatomic findings in rheumatic mite stenosis are commissurial fusion, thickened leaflets, leaflets, restricted leaflets motion, and cordal thickening and calcification. Planimetry is the preferred method for mitral valve assessments done by 2D and 3D. The 3D echo provides an accurate and reliable measurement of mitral valve area, as well as mitral regurgitation quantification. We should use whenever applicable and possible the vena contract and in PISA obtained from 3D. An integration of multiple parameters is essential for the assessment of both mitral stenosis and regurgitation. Severe rheumatic mitral stenosis is classified when the patient presents mitral valve area below 1.5 centimeter square, a PAT greater than 150 milliseconds, a mean gradients greater than 10 millimeters of mercury, and pulmonary systolic arterial pressure greater than 50 millimeters of mercury. Uh, severe rheumatic mitral regurgitation is classified when the patient presents with vena contract with greater than 0.7 centimeter vena contract area greater than 0.4 centimeter square effective regurgitant orifice area greater than 0.4 centimeter square regurgitant volume greater than 60 millimeter and regurgitant, regurgitant fraction greater than 50 percent so thank you very much for your attention. I'm glad to participate and look forward to the Q&A section. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, it was a great review um, of the new guidelines. So I would like to invite all speakers to our Q&A session. So I can see Rafael is here, Yanis, yeah thank you all for being here like uh, such a great presentations we have um many questions we have like um probably 20 25 minutes minutes to discuss most of the questions so rafael why why we like uh we try to like uh you do the questions related to your um, um presentation and i i can do the questions for Ianis, carolyn and also carlos what do you think uh, I think it's okay, Fabio. I just uh, have a technical issue here because I cannot, I don't have access to the questions on okay. my end. 
Okay. Uh, I'm no trying problem. to find then um, the Q and A. Yeah, the Q and A. It's completely blank for me. Okay. No, that's fine. That's um, I'm sure they're gonna fix that. Um, I have a, like I have all the questions here with me. Um, um, the first question goes to Dr. Shu. Dr. Shu, thank you very much for being here. It was a, such a great presentation. So, Dr. Shu, um, the first question is: How much time do you spend pre-bypass reviewing um, echo, the echo with the cardiac anesthesiologist? Do you stand at the head of the bed and look on the CART monitor, or there is another screen in the back of the room to review? This can be a loud and distracting time, hard to concentrate. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks to the organizers, and thanks, Rafa, for uh, for organizing this great session. You know, this is a wonderful opportunity to talk about some really important things, and and you know, I we're very lucky in London that we have such amazing echocardiographers. So, just to answer your first question, you know, I think it's really important as a as a surgeon and as the surgical team to you know understand the uh, echo images preoperatively um, and to have a complete plan um, with what you're going to do. So. In fact, it really depends on how much time I spend beforehand looking at the preoperative imaging. Um, so every patient that comes to the operating room will have a transthoracic echo, a transesophageal echo, and I'll review those images in detail. Often when I see the patient, but oftentimes before I even enter the operating room. And, you know, depending on how well I understand those images and how, uh, how happy I am with my primary repair plan, my backup repair plan, um, then, you know, uh, that will determine how long I'm going to spend with the echocardiographer looking at those images. Because as you're, you're totally right, it's a very busy time beforehand. There's a lot of things going on. So usually uh, I'll take that time to, you know, confirm, uh, you know, nothing's changed. There's been no progression in disease. There's nothing new there. That's a big surprise. And then we'll move on. Um, and, you know, that's, that's where you saw with the presentation from Hilda, you know, the main highlights of the things to hit up at, you know, at that very early stage and then to move on because, you know, everything follows a very tight cadence um, and you don't want to try and, you know, delay your your sort of operative steps uh, because of that. So, you know, it really varies from case to case, but in, in most cases, it's a matter of confirming what we suspected on the preoperative imaging. And, and you know, our cardiac anesthesia group spends a lot of time you know, reviewing the preoperative imaging as well. And so oftentimes what will happen is Rafa will send me a message, you know, and we'll, we'll talk the day before and say, listen, you know, this looked okay. This was a little suspect, you know, maybe we can just confirm this, talk about it in the morning of, and then move forward with the plan. And I think that's equally important. Um, okay. I totally agree, agree with you. Um, we have um, Fabio, just yeah. to add one thing, uh, and yes, we have uh, the T images on screen in front of the, uh, uh, you know, the TV that he uses for his uh, uh, video cameras. There is just besides there is a uh, full screen with the T that he can he can follow the uh, real time during the, the, the procedure. OK, thank you. Um, another question for you, Dr. Shu, um, regarding the safe distance from the circumflex artery and the inner margin of the mitral annulus on TE. Do you have any institutional guidelines regarding the distance? How, how do you approach that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, there is, um, we don't have a, a specific guideline based on the distance based on, on TE. I guess there's a few caveats to remember and to think about. So uh, one is that, um, you know, based on the preoperative coronary imaging, whether it be CT or an angiogram, you know, that's the first thing that we should be looking at. So, you know, as a surgeon, we look to see, is it left dominant or is it not? Is there a big, you know, uh, a big uh, circ branch in the, in the AV groove, uh, which can be at risk? Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing is about, is it going to be a, a mitral repair or replacement? So we did an anatomic study a few years ago where we looked at the differences and the risk is much higher with repair than replacement. And it's it's simply related to the angle that we place the annuloplasty sutures. Uh, when you do a replacement, the sutures are, are, or are perpendicular uh, to the circumflex. And so it's much more common to, you can, you can hit the circumflex, but it's very uncommon to completely uh, mm -hmm. ligate it. Whereas with a repair suture, uh, because you're kind of going parallel and the, at the, the angle that it dives off at, you can uh, you can uh, be at higher risk for injuring the circumflex. Now, the the distance on echo really only shows you that portion 
where you can see it in the AV groove. And that's where it's difficult because you can't see it all the way around all the time. Um, and so even in that portion, just because you can see whether there's flow or there or not, does not necessarily mean you didn't, you didn't injure it more distally. Um, and so what I would say is the most important thing uh, is that after, um, after when you're done your repair and you're looking on T is to really look very carefully and evaluate the segmental wall motion um, and to look for that lateral and the inferior lateral wall. And it's hard because, you know, as a surgeon, you want to, you know, obviously think that you're, you know, um, you, you never make mistakes. And, and, you know, it's at that point when you're reperfusing, you just want to give it a little more time. Is it air and all these sorts of things, but this is where it's really important that you have that relationship with your, with your uh, anesthesiologist and a cardiographer that you trust each other uh, and you evaluate it. We're very lucky in London that we have a hybrid room. So in fact, we have a, we have a protocol where if we're concerned enough, uh, then we will actually go ahead and do an on-table angiogram. Hmm at the same time to be able to evaluate and assess just to rule it out. And, you know, obviously you're going to look for the main things. So obviously T is going to be the first thing that's going to identify it. Second is going to be ST elevation, uh, recalcitrant VF. These are the sorts of things that, you know, will, will, will be common and, you know, it will happen whether you do it minimally invasively or sternotomy. And it's just, it's important to be vigilant for that sort of thing. So, you know, it, I think that it, it's, it's in our patient's best interest to have a, index suspicion for that when you see wall motion abnormalities on the echo after the fact. Um, Amazing. No, I totally agree with you. Rafa, anything to, to add on? No, no, I totally agree. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Alfaro, thank you very much for being here. So there is a question for you regarding the, the new cordi length. Um, and like the question is asking you, uh, how can you, like, uh, how do you select the endpoints of the, especially the Y prolapsing segment? Does it depend on the leaflet hinge point or crossing of annular plane? How do you measure the, especially the, the Y segment, prolapsing segment? Uh, thank you so much for, for the question. Yeah, very interesting. Um... The main problem with the prolapsing segment is it's difficult to have it in the same in the same image with the head of the papillary muscle. Mm -hmm. So basically, we just um, take it from the portion that you can see in the same uh, coaptation plane that you can see the opposite leaflet, and uh, that's for the posterior leaflet. The anterior leaflet we just measure from the head of the papillary muscle muscle to the opposite um, leaflet and the coaptation. But in the posterior, just the segment, so we don't go from the hinge point because that will add uh, a lot to the uh, prolapsing um, segment, just uh, the portion of the segment that is uh, above the coaptation uh, plane. Okay, thank you. And um, how often, like uh, in terms of like percentage, sometimes it's hard to find the, the papillary muscle. How often is your uh, success in acquiring this image to to help guiding the, the distance? Um, um... To be honest, at the beginning, when we start training uh, our fellows, it's a little bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. But uh, as Dr. Chu mentioned before, um, most of our surgeons, they just corroborate the, the distance. So we do the exercise to find the head of the papillary muscle. So we use most of the time four or five chambers view. Sometimes we use long axis view. And um, in another circumstances, we have to go to mid, uh, mid commissural view because of the problem that you are addressing right here. It's difficult mm -hmm. to align, but I will say it's, hun it's close to all the times that we are able to make the measurement, uh, especially when we have a designated person in TE that can spend a little bit of extra time to uh, acquire the image that better reflect and allow us to uh, better resolution for the measurement. But I would say most of the time, close to 100% of the time. Okay. Thank you very much. Um um, Rafael, anything to add for this session? We have more questions, but I think we should move. Yeah. To the no, I, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, Michael is here and uh, he always comes to the OR with a plan in his head. Uh, and we use the, the measurement of the cord eye just to confirm his, uh, his uh, you know, plan. Um, how often do you have difficulties, Mike, uh, when you're seeing the, the uh, pre-op TEE? Because they are performed under different conditions, the patient is sedated. You know, sometimes uh, images are suboptimal. 
how often do you come to the OR and interrupt the pre-bypass changes your plan uh, in terms of uh, length of cord eye or you know any other uh, resection and so on and so forth? Yeah, thanks, Rafa. You know, I think it really depends on the quality of the pre-op TE. Um, you know, if the pre-op TE is not well done, um, then, you know, we rely heavily on the intra-op TE. And that's where it takes a little bit more time to interrogate it uh, further, um, you know, and sometimes specifically for neocortic measurement, if we can't if we can't find any views to be able to see the papillary head in the same view as the flail, then, you know, quite often we'll go with a resection based technique instead uh, where we don't have to worry about it because then in those cases you know the neocortial length estimate will probably be more erroneous so mm -hmm. you know I, I i think it really depends if that if there's a really good high quality te done beforehand then i think that you know the plan changes very infrequently if the if the te beforehand is not well done then i would say you know the plan changes often uh, based on you know the intro the, the intraoperative TE and that it really it, it's a testament to you know the importance of high quality imaging um, you know because it makes all the difference and as I as as we've discussed many times before you know uh, having high quality imaging really improves the quality of the surgical repair that we can do and its assessment after um, you know it's taking the guessing out of it you know I think that the, the the days of the well you know as the surgeon we're just going to come in and I'll see what I'm going to do when I look at the valve you know I think that's that's historical I, I think echo is far more accurate than what we can see with our own eyes um, and it's far more functional so uh, you know having that high quality echo assessment before in the OR and after is good it's really it's that it's absolutely key to the quality of our, our repairs and reconstruction. Um, Rafael, can I add something? Sure. Um, I would like to add that, well, of course, we have, um, uh, Michael is one of our uh, main uh, surgeons to do mitral repair. We have a couple of other surgeons who also do minimal invasive repair. Um, and as from the echocardiographer perspective, I would say that the echo uh, intraoperative echo add to the already previous uh, preoperative. It doesn't change completely. It's unusual that change completely a plan from the surgeon. Maybe um, uh, even we have an excellent um, cat, uh, sorry, a echocardiography lab. I will say in the OR we use a little bit more of 3D that helps to kind of uh, see that commissure prolapse, uh, see more uh, if it's more medial, more lateral. So the surgeons just adjust the, the repair to the interpretive findings. I don't feel, uh, I'm, in my experience, it's not very common that completely change what they were planning. It just helped to, to add uh, that piece of extra information and we use a lot of 3D, I would say, um, to help uh, with, with the views. Thank you. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree totally, Hilda. And uh, I think we, one thing, I don't know how, if they do this in the echo lab, but we, we use more, we spend more time with the multi view, as you mentioned in your presentation, aligning plans and being more accurate to make sure that we are in the exact point that we want to be. And I think that adds a lot to the patient care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, moving now to the second presentation, um, Dr. Tang, thank you for being here. So we have actually two questions for you. Um, the first question, I, I think I can uh, ask both questions at the same time. So in case of moderate functional mitral regurgitation discovered at the time of the cabbage, do you use the butamine stress test, um, stress echo pre-CPB to tell whether or not the MR might improve after cabbage? And also the same case in patients with secondary moderate mitral regurgitation, but unfavorable um, predictors of uh, repair success. Would you would you replace the valve or would you leave it alone, hoping that after the cabbage uh, there is a more favorable uh, remodeling with decrease on the MR severity? Um, thanks uh, for those questions. Uh, um, I would say that, yes, it's always very important to understand uh, whether there is um, some dynamic change that happens to that mitral regurgitation uh, when you uh, increase the blood pressure and, and, and get that um, heart rate up. And that is really um, key uh, because obviously, as stated previously, uh, the difference 
effects in a uh, sedated uh, patient, um, the loading conditions are different and therefore uh, the mitral regurgitation may be underrepresented. So if you do see that dynamic um, change and you're able to increase it to the point where it is uh, severe, it makes you think that this is uh, something that might need to have something be done. Um, if we have these circumstances under which, um, depending on um, what the, uh, for if it is cabbage that we we're doing, uh, there's an error uh, specifically uh, affected uh, the papillary muscle, and then you have that tethering response. And depending on the chronicity of that uh, coronary disease and whether you think that there's a lot of uh, viable myocardium in that area as you revascularize it, you're going to assume or help, like it'll kind of sway you one way to think that once they're revascularized, that MR is going to improve and probably you don't need to do anything for the MR, um, which is, uh, that's the reason that we would kind of leave that um, that uh, moderate mitral regurgitation alone. Uh, it is helpful to know, obviously, how favorable uh, the anatomy is for any type of um, you know, percutaneous uh, approaches will have later to that mitral valve. Um, it's it's a comforting thing uh, to know that uh, if we are wrong about this and that MR does uh, get worse uh, with time, that we're able then to uh, you know clip that that uh, mitral valve uh, at some later date, rather than have to go back in and uh, and and open them up again and do a redo. Uh, so uh, you know that type. Just those considerations, along with other considerations. Obviously, this is always a, a, a time that um, weighs the risks and benefits of what we're doing. And so, obviously, um, we err on the side of trying to get the most benefit for the least amount of risk at any one procedure. And yeah, with moderate, we, we really do want to be very certain that we need mm -hmm. to add on another procedure uh, because obviously um, there is increase in uh, cardiopulmonary bypass time, especially if we're going to think that we're having to replace the valve. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there are disadvantages uh, to any type of project valve that we put in. And so we have to also consider uh, in the lifespan of this patient uh, what some of those um, risks could be. Okay. No, I totally agree. Thank you very much. Um, Yanis, uh, we have a question for you. Like, um, in terms of like, uh, when you are assessing the mitral valve, in terms of uh, mitral valve linear measurements, do you like, uh, do you do the measurements? And uh, we know like we have limit, limited time in the OR. So do you usually use the 2G measurements or do you spend more time using the, doing the 3G assessment? It takes, of course, a little bit more time. What's your practical approach for mitral valve measurements? Thank you very much for, for the question. And thank you um, for the invitation once again. Um, the classic way of uh, measuring things uh, in the OR is by 2D. Uh, and this is uh, the same uh, all across the different vendors and there's no difference between them. Uh, it's quite easy and it's quite uh, quick, which is something that the surgeons are gonna cherish for sure. But uh, uh, there's a caveat. Uh, however, if you do those things, you need to remember that the 3D valve is a 3D structure. So whenever you think about that, you 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 need to consider that there's a Y, X and, and Z vectors so if you align the measurements, you can actually increase the accuracy of your measurements. Whenever you, whatever you're doing in a 3D structure, if you consider a 3D imaging technique, uh, that's uh, a more reliable measurement. Now, uh, it not necessarily means that you're gonna take a lot of time. The, the newer uh, machines, the newer processors, are quite easy to, to give you a lot of details with a really good frame rate if you remember the, the basic principles. Uh, essentially, uh, you need to remember that the a grade 3D starts with a grade 2D. And after that, if you reduce the sector size, if you 
uh, reduce the color size as well, you're going to have a really good frame rate from which you're, you're going to be able to measure more accurately. Um, and that applies for the LBOT, the MitraVal, anything. Uh, is is the, is the same thing. Just just to 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 give you a heads up on 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 that um, possibility as well. Oh yeah, no, okay, uh, I I agree with you. I think like uh, as like uh, we should always try to do like uh, both measurements, two G and also three G. Doesn't take that long anymore. So we have pretty good softwares nowadays that allow us to make almost in in real time and uh offers uh, adds much more information i i totally agree thank you i don't want to i don't want to sound biased but uh the orthogonal views uh, the live plane multiplane npr live npr nowadays they they actually have phenomenal phenomenal uh firm mm -hmm. rate if you yeah. play with the sector size you're not going to be behind any any your, your surging is not going to be on top of you as mm -hmm. I, I remember when i was starting dr vegas uh was showing us how to how to assess the mitra valve after the repair. And all she and I remember pretty clear when she said, well, just ask the surgeon what was he doing over the weekend? What was he spending the money on? Or things like that. And they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna get distracted. So just to give you a hint. Yeah, no, I agree. I think now now the softwares and uh, the capabilities of the softwares are, are much like um, better now. So we have enough time to do this. I, I totally agree. Um, thank you. So Carlos, um, we have uh, we have actually also a couple of questions for you. So for you, how, what is it? Yeah, question to Dr. Gallardo. Our surgeons rarely try to repair the rheumatic mitral valve. What's your percentage of repairing the rheumatic mitral valve instead of replacement? And do you have any specific key findings to suggest the surgeon of repair? Well, thank you for for the question. So our our rate of repair mitral valve for mitral stenosis, rheumatic mitral valve stenosis is very rare. So the majority is is to replace the valve unless there is a, a, a primary uh, aortic valve re, re, replacement, and we see also some some moderate mitral regurgitation that we have to assess, especially when we have a, a fused commissure that the, the, the surgeon can do a commissurotomy. So that's in the case that we repair the mitral valve in rheumatic patients. So usually we have to, 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 to send some information for him to repair. Uh, also, the, the, the grade of calcification should not be very high. So the fusion of subvalval apparatus also is difficult to repair in, in this case. So if you have a, a playable uh, leaflets, uh, move with good mobility and, and, and restrict the calcification, that's a good point for, for him to, to, for the surgeon to repair. But it's very rare. Even here in Brazil, the majority of rheumatic heart uh, stenosis is replaced. Okay. Thank you. I have, uh, we also have another question here. Um, it's well known that patients with mitral stenosis, um, they have a significant reduction in the global longitudinal strain. So it's not clear if this de decrease is entirely due to LV dysfunction or is also caused by like um, reduced pre preload to the left ventricle. So my question is a very practical question. Do you use a strain for your evaluation um, in patients with mitral stenosis? What do you think of this um, technique uh, for this patient? Yeah, so I think it's a timely question. I think we have seen some, some even more application of a strain in the OR. But I'm I'm I don't use in my routine assessment of mitral mitral stenosis. Um, the clinical relevance I think is, is still is, remains uncertain. We have few data, although we have some data in in rheumatic mitral stenosis that the preoperative that when we assess the 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 global strain uh, in the left for the left ventricle and left atrial function. We have some some perspective in terms of the how the prognosis of heart failure in these patients as the, the disease progresses, we see decline in in global strain. So it should be a, a, an important uh, factor to 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 measure. But I think the also the carditis also uh, involve the myocardium. So sometimes it's not related to the the, the mitral valve area itself. But the patient can start presenting some heart failure due to due to left ventricular dysfunction, and I think global strain should be a, 
a nice uh, application for to assess this patient. But routinely, I don't use a strain uh, to assess mitral, mitral stenosis. Okay, no, thank you. Rafael, we have another like two minutes. Uh, do you have any other questions that you'd like to answer or discuss? No, I think I'm all done. Okay, so I have one more question. I think um, we have time for that one, Dr. Alfaro. So this question is more is very practical and uh, is related to the central line insertion for the minimum invasive mitral valve cases. So he showed us that he used like a, like a, like two guide wires for the on the same vein, uh, not only to put the central line but also put the drainage cannula. How does it work in, in terms of practical terms in the operating room? Do you like uh, since you have to use different size uh, of dilators to be able to thread the cannula? Um, do you do it yourself? Uh, someone from the surgical surgical team also joins you um, to do this procedure. And also, how do you, do you keep the sterile conditions with your central line since they're all going to be in the same surgical field? Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Papa, for the uh, question. So yes, um, we do uh, the placement of the uh, central line in the surgical cannula with the surgical team, so we scrap with them. We have a dedicated um, assistant to help us with that, um, a fellow or one of the surgical assistant or the surgeon in, uh, himself. And in, in other than that, we have a perfusionist that is in charge of the infusion mm -hmm. after the line is placed. And it, it is the one who is in charge of um, flashing all the lines and all that. And um, usually we have two people in the cardiac OR in the forms of a fellow and a consultant or two consultants. So one is completely scrubbed and the other one is kind of taking care of patients and doing the echo. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do have two different sets of dilators. We use uh, two dilators for the um, for the surgical cannulation because it's a it's a big cannula, usually seven French. So um, uh, we keep the sterility of the of the field in the way they place the surgical drapes. So they place the surgical drapes in a way that we can't remove them uh, after the central, the surgical um, cannula is placed. And we uh, have like a big uh, piece of plastic going all the way up that is mm -hmm. sterile as well. And it's between, it's gonna be placed between the surgical cannula in our central line. So we usually try to have a separation of at least one inch between, uh, I mean, when patient's anatomy allows. So we have enough room for them to do the compressions and the removal of the cannula at the end of the procedure. They have mm -hmm. enough room for that. And also to put a sterile um, barrier between uh, them and us. So we can not um, just put the dre uh, dress in, in our central line and continue the procedure. Okay, no, yeah, make more sense. I was curious. Well, uh, we don't have um, more time. I'd like, you, uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here. It was a, such a great quest, uh, session. I truly appreciate all the information that, that you, you guys brought to us. Um, I'm going to finish the session now. Don't forget to answer the, um, the evaluation forms. And uh, we can uh, we uh, regroup again in 15 minutes for the, the next session. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Great session. Thank you. Thank you.